Item number, SCP-005. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-005 poses no immediate risk in any direct sense. Even so, its unique functions require special measures be taken to restrict access and manipulation of the object. Approval of at least one level 4 personnel is required for the removal of the object from its containment area. Description In appearance, SCP-005 resembles an ornate key, displaying the characteristics of a typical mass-produced key used in the 1920s. The key was discovered when a civilian used it to infiltrate a high-security facility. SCP-005 seems to have the unique ability to open any and all forms of lock, be they mechanical or digital, with relative ease. The origin of this ability is yet to be determined. Additional Notes SCP-005 may be used as a replacement for lost security passes, but only under the supervision of at least one Level 4 personnel. SCP-005 may not be used for vending machine repairs, opening lockers, or for any personnel's spare home key. Removal of the object from the compound will result in immediate termination. Appendix A While SCP-005 has been shown to be effective in removing almost any form of locking device, further experiments have shown that efforts to disguise the purpose or identity of a lock have proven at least somewhat successful in defeating SCP-005's ability. In approximately 50% of cases where a volunteer was not able to identify a locking device as such, SCP-005 was not successful in deactivating the device. Due to these results, SCP-005 has been tentatively classified as sentient, and further tests are being run to determine its cognitive abilities. However, there are no results that show any traits that prevent it from being able to identify any particular locking device only that the aforementioned device has been heavily concealed and disguised. Item Number SCP-068 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-068 is to be kept away from any metals in an electrically resistant box, preferably made of polytetrafluoroethylene, or Teflon, and rubber. Said box is to be stored in Security Locker 26, at Site 11. Keys kept with Dr. Any requests for testing are to be redirected to him. Description SCP-068 is a wire stick figure, 9.8 centimeters tall, made of an unknown metal. The figure is composed of a single wire, looping back to the center. The wire itself appears to have been bent numerous times in multiple places. When an electric current is introduced to SCP-068, it becomes animate. Moving about on its own, SCP-068's joints are where a normal human beings would be. Once activated, SCP-068 begins to search for any metallic material. Once metal has been found, SCP-068 will begin to knead it and pull a thin strip of metal off. SCP-068 will then construct another figure similar to itself. The newly created figure will begin to knead the remaining metal alongside the original, creating new figures, which in turn, produce more replicas. SCP-068 will move on to its next stage after one of two requirements are met. The first is when there are no more metals in range with enough mass to produce another figure. The other is when an upper limit of 102 replicas are created. When either of these events occur, all figures will converge at one location and begin forming themselves into as big a figure as possible. With a maximum of 102 mini-figures, the resulting figure reaches 2 meters in height. SCP-068 situates itself in the intersection of the torso, arms, and head. Gamma, beta, and theta waves begin emanating from SCP-068 after this union. SCP-068 will then begin to search for metals again, attempting to create more figures only scaled up to whatever size 068 is currently at. These replicas do not emanate brainwaves like 068 does. If 068 is not at the maximum size limit after this, it will continue to create and add more figures to itself until the limit is reached. Once it has reached the second stage and there are no metals available from which to construct figures, SCP-068 returns to its dormant state after 4 minutes and 32 seconds of activity. 
Materials surrounding the original figure must be melted away in order to retrieve 068. SCP-068 is capable of kneading and manipulating any metal presented to it, regardless of properties. It also appears to be impervious to any attempts to damage or destroy it. Copies of SCP-068, however, have the same properties and vulnerabilities as whatever metal they were constructed from. SCP-068 can detect metals hidden from view through an as-of-yet unknown process. While 068 will not attempt to reach metals that are too difficult to get to, it will tear through anything that is soft enough for its limbs to penetrate. What it considers soft enough changes depending on what 068 is shaped from at the time. Addendum 068-A A proposal has been made to use SCP-068 to dispose of dangerous metal-based SCPs. Addendum 068-B The proposal to use 068 for disposal of dangerous metal-based SCPs has been denied, seeing as how many, if not all, of our dangerous metal-based SCPs are also invincible. The only thing we would have is a bunch of invulnerable wire figures running about. Honestly, who even thought this up? Dr. Item Number SCP-070 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-070 is to be kept within a 10 meter by 10 meter reinforced concrete room that is to be guarded and remotely monitored at all times. This room must always be well stocked with non-perishable food and water, as well as basic amenities for humanoid SCPs. Security personnel assigned to SCP-070 are to carry sticky foam guns, in addition to standard armaments. Structural integrity of SCP-070's containment room is to be checked twice daily. In case of excessive structural damage, SCP-070 is to be incapacitated and relocated to a nearby backup containment room, as described above. If a reinforced concrete room of sufficient strength is not available, SCP-070 may be temporarily contained in a cell of stronger material until another concrete room can be prepared. SCP-070 is to be given sedatives and painkillers on request, but no more than maximum dosage is determined by Dr. Dumont. Personnel who enter SCP-070's containment room for any reason must be unarmed and should wear puncture-resistant body armor. Armed guards must remain outside and out of sight of SCP-070. In case of containment breach due to somnambulism, security personnel are to alert site administration, place food and water in the apparent path of SCP-070, and maintain a clear zone of 25 meters around SCP-070. In any other case of containment breach, or if SCP-070 becomes violent during somnambulism, Personnel are authorized to incapacitate SCP-070 using sticky foam. Care must be taken to avoid smothering SCP-070. Because SCP-070 reflexively responds violently to injury or attack, security personnel should refrain from using lethal force or otherwise injuring SCP-070 if at all possible. Description SCP-070 appears to be a human male of Native American descent, with a normal appearance save for a pair of rusty metal wings emerging from his back. Each wing is composed of several flat iron bars, about six centimeters wide, connected end-to-end -end by rotating rivets, to form an articulated length of metal over two meters long. Hanging from these bars are chains of various lengths, 22 on each wing, each tipped with a barbed arrowhead. SCP-070 appears to have no other anomalous properties besides these wings. The wings of SCP-070 appear to act independently of the person they are attached to, and SCP-070 has stated repeatedly that it has no control over them. However, when damage has been done to the wings, SCP-070 has shown signs of physiological distress, including sweating, reduced blood flow to face, and screaming in pain. The wings have been observed to fold and expand, shoot out and whip its chains at high speed, both individually and collectively and anchor its arrowheads into concrete, wood, and like materials. While SCP-070 has not displayed any overt hostility to personnel, it will often react violently to perceived threats by lashing its chains out at assailants and wrapping its chains around its body in a defensive posture. The most effective means of subdual has proven to be sticky foam, non-lethal weaponry, which can reliably ensnare SCP-070's chains from a safe distance. Despite their rusted appearance, 
The wings and chains of SCP-070 are as strong as high-quality alloy steel. However, they are also as dense as steel, and SCP-070 cannot move about as a normal human due to the weight of its wings. As yet, SCP-070 has been unable or unwilling to use its wings to facilitate human locomotion. SCP-070 spends much of its time anchored to the walls and ceiling of its containment cell, usually sedated. Addendum 070-1 Incident 070-1 On at 3.36, SCP-070 breached containment. Security personnel were advised that SCP-070 appeared to be asleep and were ordered to not engage SCP-070 and to keep others away. By lashing and anchoring chains into the walls and ceiling in front of it, SCP-070 was able to carry itself, still apparently asleep, through sight. SCP-070 broke into the food stores of Canteen 4 and proceeded to gorge itself on the available food and water. Almost 19 minutes later, apparently sated, SCP-070 returned to its containment room. At no time did SCP-070 appear to wake up. SCP-070 claimed no knowledge of the event afterward. Addendum 070-2 Personal Background Interviews have revealed that SCP-070 is named and is capable of reciting the correct social security number for a U.S. citizen of the same name and age. SCP-070 claims to be a member of the Kiowa tribe, and data expunged. SCP-070 claims to not know how the wings came to be, only remembering waking up in a scrapyard with them after taking a lot of peyote the night before. Item Number SCP-073 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-073 is to be kept in a two-room cell, furnished with all non-organic furniture and items, and a bathroom. Subject is allowed to freely wander the facility and eat in the main canteen. A tracking device has been attached to SCP-073's person and is not to be removed. Subject is disallowed any contact with the surface and is not allowed outside the facility. Subject is allowed no contact with plant-based SCPs under any circumstances. Violence is not to be used against SCP-073 under any circumstances. SCP-073 is currently kept in Site-17. Description SCP-073 appears to be a heavily tanned male of Arabic or Middle Eastern descent in his early 30s, 185 centimeters or 6 feet and 1 inches tall, and 75 kilograms or 165 pounds, with black hair and blue eyes. Arms, legs, spinal cord, and shoulder blades of the subject appear to have been replaced with artificial versions of unknown make and metal. Subject only takes notice of this when it is pointed out and states that it has no knowledge of how, why, or when these replacements took place, stating it had them as long as it could remember. There is a symbol engraved into the forehead of the subject, which appears to be of Sumerian origin. Symbol has as of yet been untranslated and subject appears distressed when the symbol is mentioned at all, refusing to speak on it. Subject does not need to eat and drink on a regular basis, but is strictly carnivorous, owing to its effect on plant-based items. SCP-073, who refers to itself as Cain, is generally polite and genial to all who speak to it, though it has been described as being cold and somewhat mechanical in its speech. It is very helpful and enjoys aiding personnel in their daily actions, whatever they may be. It has highly detailed knowledge of ancient to recent events in history and most commonly spoken languages in the world, including ones that have since died out. Subject has professed to having a photographic memory, remembering word for word all text in an 800-page dictionary that was flicked through in a minute and a half. It has scored above average in all intelligence tests given to it. SCP-073's presence is inimical to any and all life grown in soil, causing death to any such life within a 20-meter radius. Any land SCP-073 has walked on, and any within the 20-meter radius, becomes barren as all anaerobic bacteria dies, rendering the soil incapable of supporting life until new bacteria are introduced. Anything that is derived from soil-grown life, such as wood and paper, immediately rots and disintegrates upon touch of SCP-073. Further affected derivatives include anything hydroponically grown. 
Violence directed towards SCP-073 reflects any damage inflicted on SCP-073 directly back onto the attacker, although SCP-073 visibly remains unharmed. This applies to any damage directed at SCP-073. Attempts to get tissue and blood samples have proven futile. When the procedure was initiated, personnel carrying out the action felt the sensation of whatever was applied to SCP-073 and wound up with a sample of their own blood or tissue. Despite the fact that all actions were directed solely at SCP-073, indirect damage through a medium also results in the person perpetrating the action receiving the wounds caused. Although SCP-073 receives no actual harm from damage to its person, it has stated that it still feels the pain of the action and has politely asked researchers to abstain from overly harmful actions to its person. Additional Notes SCP-073 was found in the New York Police Department in 19... having been taken in after subject had been found amidst the bodies of several violent gang members. SCP-073 told police members that the gang had attempted to make sport of it, but became angry and attempted to kill SCP-073, resulting in their own demise. SCP-073 was incarcerated and was deemed a John Doe when NYPD could not find any information on it. SCP-073 came to the attention of the Foundation through a routine inspection of John Doe's and was subsequently released into our custody. Addendum 073-1 In light of SCP-073's indestructible nature, photographic memory, and general will to please, High Command have deemed that all information is to be backed up on SCP-073, ensuring it is not lost in the event of a catastrophe. While this action has met with mixed responses, SCP-073 has agreed and sworn itself to secrecy on its part. Addendum 073-2 When information concerning SCP-076 was brought to the attention of SCP-073 for backing up, subject showed familiarity with the information, although was disinclined to adding to it, despite the fact that it stated that it already knew all about SCP-076. It then stated it would be better for all parties involved that it not meet SCP-076. Addendum 073-3 Examination of the unidentified metal on SCP-073 has suggested that it is beryllium bronze, a metal that has been documented as being utilized by various anomalous cultures and entities. Most notably, beryllium bronze is a component found in SCP-1216, SCP-1427, SCP-2481, and SCP-2711. In light of this discovery, the Foundation began working in an attempt to trace the origin of beryllium bronze and how it initially spread throughout the world. When prompted, SCP-073 was able to provide information that suggests that beryllium bronze originated in the Middle East, though the exact point of origin has yet to be determined. Further research into the origin of beryllium bronze is currently ongoing. Item Number SCP-100 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-100 is to have six guards patrolling the interior of the perimeter's fencing and two guards dedicated to the monitoring of the interior and exterior of both warehouses and the residential building, with rotations to occur every three hours. Any unauthorized personnel found within SCP-100 are to be detained for questioning prior to amnestic administration and release. Three guards are to remain within the storefront of SCP-100, with rotations to occur every eight hours. The storefront front entrance is to remain locked at all times, with keys provided to necessary personnel. Private property and no trespassing signs are to be posted on the front of the storefront to deter any drivers from stopping at SCP-100. Any constructs SCP-101 creates are to be removed from SCP-100 and melted down into slag, with the exception of SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B. Should SCP-101 become uncooperative, SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B may be removed from SCP-100 until the time that SCP-101 becomes cooperative again. The largest of the two warehouses within SCP-100 has been converted into a basic research facility. All objects created by SCP-101, excluding SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B, may be used for research purposes. 
Testing on SCP-101 itself may only be conducted with written permission from the acting head researcher. Description: SCP-100 is an abandoned scrapyard, 80 kilometers from South Carolina, known as Jamaican Joe's Junkyard Jubilee. The scrapyard covers roughly 5,000 square meters of fenced-off land, consisting of two warehouses, a storefront, and a small residential building, as well as neglected land and land used for storage. SCP-100 holds roughly 1,500 vehicles, both pressed and unpressed, as well as roughly 1,400 kilograms of separate scrap, estimated to be worth $5,000 or 3,870 euros. SCP-100's anomalous effect manifests through SCP-101 and its constructs, including SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B. Autonomy is lost when SCP-101 or one of its objects cross the fenced perimeter of SCP-100, remaining in this state until reintroduction. SCP-101 is an autonomous, sapient, humanoid construct, consisting mostly of copper piping, uninsulated copper wiring, and aluminum cans. SCP-101 lacks the ability for written or verbal communication. However, it possesses the ability to communicate using rudimentary sign language. SCP-101 is largely uninterested in conversation outside of sales, and information gathered from it has been limited. SCP-101 appears to possess skill and craftsmanship, demonstrating the ability to operate tools such as arc welders, drills, and power saws, as well as heavy machinery such as car compressors and forklifts. SCP-101 possesses the ability to create autonomous constructs similar to itself, using material available within SCP-100. SCP-101 tends to create four specific animals – iguanas, crocodiles, turtles, and flamingos. However, SCP-101 has been known to craft other species, such as domestic pets. To maintain compliance, SCP-101 has been allowed to keep two objects, labeled SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B. SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B are constructs superficially resembling insects, assumed to be created by SCP-100, as they have occupied SCP-100 since the initial discovery of SCP-100. The names Ramon and Beatrice are welded into the backs of SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B, respectively. They appear to operate as both companions as well as guards for SCP-100 as they patrol the perimeter of SCP-100 except during intervals of interaction with SCP-101. SCP-101 appears to follow a ritualistic schedule, repeating the same actions daily. From 0800 to 1500 hours, SCP-101 enters the storefront of SCP-100, seating itself behind a counter and attempting to bargain with any humans within the storefront. Occasionally, SCP-101 will return to the yard prematurely for reasons unknown. From 1500 to 1600 hours, SCP-101 interacts with SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B, communicating using vague hand and arm gestures. Interaction tends to consist of grooming, repair, and activities resembling fetch and hide-and-seek. From 1600 to 2000 hours, SCP-101 performs various tasks, including taking stock of material within SCP-100, cleaning and maintaining tools and heavy machinery and cleaning the interiors and exteriors of buildings present within SCP-100. From 20 hundred hours to 0 hundred hours, SCP-101 performs what is assumed to be leisurely acts, ranging from creating new constructs, interacting with SCP-102-A and SCP-102-B, and patrolling SCP-100. From 0 hundred hours to 0800, SCP-101 enters the residential building, where it remains seated at a desk for the duration of this time. In the event that a human enters the storefront of SCP-100 during the interval of time SCP-101 is seated behind the counter, SCP-101 will attempt to bargain with them, using a variety of gestures to convey meaning. Most attempts by SCP-101 are to sell scrap, figures of its own creation, or repair services. However, it has been known to purchase scrap. Despite SCP-101's inability to read, it possesses the ability to perform basic mathematics, as demonstrated by sales. Sales made by SCP-101 are typically met with some degree of unfairness. 
SCP-101 has been known to intentionally use faulty scales and contaminate scrap piles with cheaper metals, and has demonstrated knowledge of the area of effect within SCP-100. As SCP-101 has sold constructs repeatedly, despite the loss of autonomy when exiting SCP-100. Efforts to confront SCP-101 about this have been met with both distress and indifference, with referral to a sign posted on the wall reading, No refunds, man, happening regardless of SCP-101's emotional response. SCP-101 was discovered on 110976, following reports of strange machines operating from within the scrapyard. These rumors were discredited as urban legends and a Foundation agent was sent to SCP-100 to act as the landowner until containment was performed under the guise of property sale. A wooden privacy fence was built along the former perimeter of SCP-100, one-way windows were installed in the storefront, and a highway now running through the nearby town of redirects the majority of civilian traffic. Addendum 100A Records show the property is owned by one Joseph Duvall, with the mailing address sharing the same name. Local utility companies report billing had stopped approximately three months before the discovery of SCP-100, which was found abandoned save for SCP-101, SCP-102-A, SCP-102-B, and several avian and canine figures, presumed to be made by SCP-101. The initial sweep of the buildings revealed the residential building to be mostly bare, with the only sign of former occupants being a note found taped to the door of the storefront. Incident 100-A on 060305, SCP-101 created a humanoid, autonomous construct, 10 centimeters in height, the first time SCP-101 has done so. Significant effort was put into this construct compared to others, with greater detail applied to the construct, including facial features, and JJ welded into the back of the construct, and stainless steel making up the majority of the construct. SCP-101 placed the construct on the counter of the storefront for the duration of this scheduled interval, both using vague gestures to seemingly communicate with one another. Following the confiscation of this construct, SCP-101 remained seated within the residential building of SCP-100 for a total of 10 days. Document 100-A The following is a copy of the note recovered upon discovery of SCP-100. Out to lunch. Please see assistant. JJ. Item Number SCP-146 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Containment procedures have been revised after it was noted that the effects of SCP-146 were sharply and dangerously increased under previous containment. A standard 1 half 0.5 meter cubed secure storage bin. The bin should remain free, however should a researcher wish to test SCP-146 at high intensity. Level 3 clearance is required for any personnel wishing to enclose or cover SCP-146 for a period exceeding two days. During normal storage, SCP-146 is to be kept on a marble pedestal in its storage room, located data expunged. SCP-146's standard storage room measures no less than 20 square meters, with stuccoed walls, and a ceiling painted to resemble a clear daytime sky. The room is to be kept well lit, full daylight equivalent, at all times, furnished with an assortment of potted plants, which must be tended to daily, and decorated in the style of the late Republican period of Rome, circa 120-80 BCE. Experimentation with different interior styles has shown that SCP-146 seems to prefer this arrangement and to have aesthetic preferences consistent with the aristocracy of Rome from that era. While this containment is standard, researchers with clearance level 2 or higher may experiment with different containment settings in order to modify the effects of SCP-146. While SCP-146 is non-motile and therefore requires little security itself, personnel entering its containment area or handling it in any way must not make eye contact with SCP-146. Any attempts to cover SCP-146 in order to prevent eye contact is prohibited, as this has been shown to increase SCP-146 effect at an unpredictable rate. In general, one day of covering or confinement will cause SCP-146 to skip over the beginning phase of its effect and begin with the most traumatic memories. After three days, SCP-146 has been shown to produce its effect without having to make direct eye contact first. After seven days, 
the effect of SCP-146 is both far more intense and no longer confined to subjects within SCP-146's field of vision. Researchers in an adjacent room were affected, and one was permanently Permission to experiment beyond seven days is denied. By order of O5, blinders and decorative screens are available for personnel who must enter SCP-146's containment area for maintenance. Description SCP-146 is a hollow bronze head, apparently a fragment of a complete statue or bust, depicting a crowned young woman or perhaps an effeminate young man. The head exhibits severe vertigrees over much of its surface. The crown of SCP-146 is inlaid with silver decorations, and its eyes, the apparent source of SCP-146's effects, are beaten silver, shined to be mildly reflective. To date, SCP-146 has not exhibited any signs of movement, but its reaction to certain decor in its containment area indicates that it may possess a degree of sentience, if not outright sapience. If SCP-146 is able to communicate, it has not yet done so. SCP-146 exhibits the ability to access and bring to mind certain memories in those who initiate eye contact. These memories are usually tied to a sense of guilt or shame in the subject. After initial eye contact is made, the subject need only remain somewhere in SCP-146's field of vision for the memories and associated feelings to become more intense, although continual eye contact speeds the process. Upon initial eye contact with SCP-146, recent memories will begin to surface in the subject. For example, subjects who have ignored a friend in the hall or exceeded the speed limit will be reminded of these events and begin to feel mildly guilty, whether or not they would normally care about the event. With continued exposure to the gaze of SCP-146, the subject will begin to recall older and more vivid memories, with a corresponding increase in feelings of shame in the subject. Generally, after 30 minutes of exposure, the memories will move from being vivid recollections to intense hallucinations, with the subject unable to distinguish the past from the present or the imagined from the real. Subjects have been observed to regress in personality as well, particularly in cases where the memories of childhood trauma have been brought up. Any test subjects exposed for over 30 minutes should be restrained, both for their own safety and the safety of others. All subjects to date who have been exposed to SCP-146 for 60 minutes have completely retreated into their hallucinations. So far, no such subject has been restored to consciousness from this near-catatonic state. Such subjects must be fed intravenously and are unresponsive to external stimuli, save for occasional murmurings consistent with their regression. It has also been noted that when subjects recall a shameful event, they will often feel compelled to make amends for their actions. This is not generally a problem in the case of minor offenses, and has in some cases led to greater unity among the staff. However, problems arise when the subject cannot make amends, either because the offended party cannot be contacted, or because the transgression is somehow irredeemable. Sometimes, the subject will put forth renewed positive efforts in order to balance out their guilt. However, in most such cases, subjects fall into a deep depression and or turn to some form of self-punishment, including self-mutilation and suicide. SCP-146 was acquired from a Mr. of Birmingham, UK. He had acquired SCP-146 during the estate sale of a renowned philanthropist, Lord It was purchased in a lot with a number of other artifacts. When its new owner began to experience SCP-146's effects, he began seeing a psychiatrist, undercover agent UA-33-56G. The man was put into an institution, and SCP-146 was taken into Foundation custody. Experiment Log 146-01 In order to calibrate a baseline for SCP-146's effects, a standard 4 meter by 4 meter interrogation room was divided in half by an opaque curtain. SCP-146 was placed on a table inside a protective plexiglass case in one half of the room. On the other side of the curtain, subject D044323 was restrained, such that he was looking directly at SCP-146's position. Researchers maintained constant communication with the subject via intercom throughout the testing process. The curtain was dropped, causing the subject to look squarely into the eyes of SCP-146. 
the subject voiced immediate discomfort and closed his eyes with an increase in heart rate of 15 BPM. With prompting, the subject related the memories he was recalling, beginning with minor breaches of behavior protocol. The subject then recalled several altercations with other prisoners before his being taken by the Foundation, including a particularly graphic description of data expunged. Researchers noted that as time went on, the subject became more cooperative and his speech patterns changed, resembling someone undergoing therapeutic hypnosis. After 15 minutes, the subject's speech had become slurred, and his EEG patterns showed similarities to someone experiencing vivid dreams. The subject entered into one half of a dialogue, which culminated in his trying to break his restraints. After several minutes, the subject ceased thrashing and began to cry. The subject started begging, apparently to someone in his hallucination. Stop. Take it back. Don't. I won't do it again. I'm sorry. I don't want to. Not again. Stop. Please. This behavior continued until, after 54 minutes of exposure to SCP-146, the subject's vocalizations halted and his EEG showed signs consistent with coma. After an additional hour, no further effects were observed and the subject was removed and euthanized. Note, at this point, SCP-146 was being kept along with the other artifacts purchased at auction because it was not yet known that the effect was confined to SCP-146 alone. I theorized that this containment approximated favorable containment and therefore kept SCP-146's effect at its base strength. Professor Scully, Experiment Log 146-04 The first experiment conducted after it was determined that SCP-146 consisted only of the bronze head took place after SCP-146 had been moved to a standard one half meter cubed storage bin where it had remained for two days. Subject D-044784 and SCP-146 were placed on opposite sides of a curtain in a standard interrogation room as in previous experiments. The subject was restrained as in previous experiments. When the curtain was dropped, the subject reported an immediate headache and began to cry. The subject's heart rate jumped to 180 BPM, but then dropped rapidly to 40 BPM, and the subject lost consciousness. Medical personnel entered the room and began examining the subject, at which time the subject regained consciousness, her heart rate spiking to 175 BPM. The subject struggled violently against her restraints and was soon able to break the restraint on her right arm, severely damaging her own arm and hand in the process. Paramedic D was injured as the subject struck him in order to gain access to his first aid kit. The subject was able to grab a small scalpel and jam it into her own neck before guards could regain control. Medical staff administered first aid, but the subject died during emergency surgery due to blood loss. Note. After several similar incidents, it was determined that SCP-146's ability was affected by its containment. Anyone wishing to do further research must take this into account, as even brief accidental exposure could prove harmful. Professor Scully Item Number SCP-148 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Revision 3 SCP-148 is to be stored as 120 cast ingots, each of which weighs approximately 10 kilograms at time of writing. Ingots of SCP-148 may not be housed at the same site as any SCP due to the potential for unforeseen interactions. Otherwise, said ingots should be distributed equally among acceptable Foundation facilities. The mass of each contained ingot of SCP-148 must be measured and reported monthly. Under no circumstances should any SCP with mind-affecting or extrasensory properties come into contact with SCP-148. In the event of such contact, the immediate area must be evacuated and the affected sample of SCP-148 detonated remotely. Personnel are not to be assigned to SCP-148 for a period of time longer than three weeks. Any personnel assigned to SCP-148 are to be given regular psychological evaluations. Description SCP-148 is a metallic substance composed of a variety of known and unknown elements. The total mass of SCP-148 on hand is approximately 1.2 tons. 
SCP-148 has a gray-green color with a bluish tinge and oxidizes readily in the presence of water. SCP-148 has a melting transition point of approximately 4,500 degrees Celsius and a boiling transition point of approximately 9,000 degrees Celsius. SCP-148 has a density of 6.76 grams by cubic centimeters and qualifies as HRC-39 in a Rockwell hardness test. It exhibits material properties such as strength, ductility, and workability, similar to platinum. SCP-148 is composed primarily of platinum and iridium, the two composing 62% and 20% of its mass respectively. In addition, several other known metals are present in its composition, including iron, cobalt, and copper, which collectively makes up 16.5% of SCP-148's mass. However, given the mass of the material, it is believed that there are other substances not detectable by mass spectrometry or other means. Images of SCP-148 taken with a scanning tunneling microscope show gaps in its lattice that, under normal circumstances, would be filled with other materials. SCP-148 blocks or otherwise hinders extrasensory mind-affecting properties of living organisms in proximity to it. This effect, while difficult to quantify, appears inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the subject to SCP-148's surface and directly proportional to the quantity of SCP-148 in consideration. The range for which this effect is detectable is roughly 0.8 meters per kilogram of SCP-148. 1.1 tons of SCP-148 were retrieved from the Metallurgical Department of Prometheus Labs' base facility during the Foundation's sweep of the building. Documents concerned with the project had unveiled that the substance was to be subject to additional development, sold to an undisclosed buyer, trademarked, and sold as Telekill Alloy. However, due to and its political fallout, along with the destruction of the Prometheus Labs' base facility, has acquired an estimated 1.3 tons of SCP-148 and sold it to unknown buyers. Foundation agents and forensic accountants are in the process of tracking the remaining supplies of SCP-148. Addendum 148-01 Due to its potential for use in containment of mind-affecting SCPs, SCP-148 has been approved for cross-testing with SCP objects. While tests are still in their early stages, Tests with low-level anomalous items seem to indicate that SCP-148 will be an effective tool in containing said items. However, it does not appear to affect items whose notable properties are purely mimetic. Note, as of Incident 148-1, contact between SCP-148 and any mind-affecting items is strictly forbidden. Addendum 148-02 Beginning Staff reported irrational behavior and poor communication skills among janitorial staff tasked with regular maintenance of SCP-148's containment. At the time, containment consisted of a single storeroom, swept and checked on a daily basis. After three weeks of increasingly abnormal behavior, two custodians were taken in for questioning and examination. Testing revealed that the aforementioned personnel were incapable of interpreting body language and did not appear to notice the intonation or phrasing of sentences. In addition, the affected subjects were incapable of determining the emotional state or intent of others and demonstrated severely limited vocabulary. Further testing has revealed that the language and communication skills of persons with regular contact or extended exposure to SCP-148 will, over time, deteriorate and disappear. It has been shown that, after eight weeks, affected subjects will be rendered completely mute and incapable of understanding or giving nonverbal requests, commands, or other statements, despite showing otherwise normal mental capacity. Addendum 148-03 A measurement taken several months after the Foundation's acquisition of SCP-148 indicated that, despite no increase in volume, SCP-148 has increased in mass by 0.1 tons, a density increase of 9%. The source of this additional mass is unknown. Incident Report 148-1 To test the limits of SCP-148's effects and its capacity to change in mass, 0.9 kilograms of it was placed on a scale 
and moved to SCP Records chamber. Predictably, SCP Records effect was nullified by SCP 148's presence. However, the sample of SCP 148 began to grow in mass by upwards of 5 grams per second. After one minute, this rate began to decrease, and SCP 148 ceased to increase in mass 40 seconds later, at which point, it weighed 1.4 kilograms. It remained at this mass for 8 seconds, before plummeting to 0.8 kilograms in the space of 2 seconds. During this time, personnel within 60 meters, 12 times the effective range of SCP, began to experience said SCP's effects, albeit at a vastly increased rate, resulting in data expunged, locked down, until the affected subjects could be removed. Addendum 148-04 Measurements taken since Incident 148-1 indicate that the combined mass of SCP-148 is increasing at a rate of It is speculated that should a large quantity of SCP-148 undergo an event similar to the sample used in Experiment 148-1, data expunged, containment procedures are under review. Item Number SCP-184 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-184 is not to be contained in any structure. SCP-184 is to be attached to a high-power electromagnet at all times. Should the electromagnet fail, agents are to report to SCP-184's containment area and prevent access to all unauthorized personnel until the electromagnet is restored to power. The containment area for SCP-184 is currently configured to resemble a park, with SCP-184 and its containment magnet disguised as statuary. Any and all visitors are to be monitored. Any structures affected by SCP-184 are to be demolished after review by data expunged. Final demolition approval or inclusion into SCP will also be determined by this body. No investigation is to be done into affected structures without approval and a rescue team on standby. Description SCP-184 is a small, smooth, metallic object, 10 centimeters or 4 inches tall and 10 centimeters or 4 inches wide, in the shape of a dodecahedron. Each face of the figure has a circular hole in the center, and a small sphere is attached to each vertex. SCP-184 is made of an unknown but highly magnetic alloy, about as hard as brass. When inside an enclosed structure, SCP-184 expands the structure's inner dimensions without altering its outer dimensions. SCP-184 will increase the inner dimensions of any enclosed structure by several hundred meters each day, beginning one hour after entry into the structure. Initially, SCP-184 only extends the walls out, causing rooms to become much larger without adjusting the height of the room. This expansion continues until the original dimensions of the room have been tripled. At this point, SCP-184 starts creating wholly new rooms. SCP-184 is apparently able to copy items from inside the structure, creating furnished rooms consistent with the rest of the structure. After a period of time, however, the expansion process appears to break down. For example, items will be made from inappropriate materials. Glass books, a wooden microwave, rooms will be oddly shaped, doors will open into blank walls, and hallways will be tiny or twist back around in long mazes. The new inside structures continue to be more and more odd, while the outside remains unchanged. This behavior is most dramatically illustrated in homes. However, it has been observed in other instances, including a cardboard box. The changes do not go away with the removal of SCP-184, but no additional structures are created. Addendum 184-1 Notes from Dr. I don't think I need to stress the fact that this thing can never be allowed into Site-19. We may need to look into different containment at some point. But for the time being, we will keep it in the open, immovable, and hidden. Addendum 184-2 Locations of Interest It is currently hypothesized that SCP-184 or an anomaly with a similar effect may be responsible for the creation of locations of interest 
such as Backdoor Soho and Chugoku Cellar. Investigation into SCP-184 as a potential origin for these spaces is ongoing. Addendum 184-38RB Notes on Recovery SCP-184 was recovered in the Kowloon Walled City in June of Reports of the city's bizarre and explosive growth attracted operatives, who soon learned of SCP-184, held in the possession of Data Expunged. After several police crackdowns, Mobile Task Force Zeta-9 was dispatched and recovered SCP-184 with minimal losses. The final effect of exposure to SCP-184 on both the city and inhabitants may never be fully understood, due to the reckless actions of local law enforcement, which destroyed several affected sections of the city before operatives could take action to prevent it. Interviews with residents yielded minimal information, with a communal wall of silence being the major response. A few documents indicated that SCP-184 could be brought into a home and allowed to affect the dwelling for 50 pounds sterling per half hour. These documents were unconfirmed by residents. Addendum 184-38RB-S Additional Documentation Personal Log of Gordon Richards, Member of Mobile Team Zeta-9, The Mole Rats Date June 3rd Dispatched to the Kowloon Walled City to recover an object and document anything affected by it. I have never seen such a horrible place. The filth is everywhere, whole walls and even structures made of garbage. If you crack your suit for even a second, you get flooded by the smell of smoke, cooking, sweat, machine oil, and excrement. Henry fell into a pit used as a sewer on the ground level after breaking through a trash walkway. He was fine. The suit was just filthy, but he threw up and had to be removed. I'm not sure if he's going to work out. Everyone here avoids us like the plague, or darts out to throw trash or insults. They are a tribe, and a territorial one at that. The sheer crush of humanity is intimidating, and I'm glad I have the suit between me and them. The object is supposed to be somewhere in the core of this mass, but getting there is going to be tricky. Date, June 4th. Local law enforcement led by agents did a bunch of raids last night. Cleared people out of some of the areas we need to go in, but there are so many people here it's hard to notice any difference. Yesterday's recon helped uncover a couple homes affected by this thing. They don't look like much, the same squalid homes as everyone else, but they are too big inside. It's an odd feeling, standing with your hand on the wall and knowing that by all rights, you should be six feet outside the structure in midair. Henry is better today, but seems really jumpy. Lev took him aside and talked to him last night, and I hope it's helped. I'm getting worried about him. Caught him muttering to himself over the radio today. Told him to knock it off, but didn't report it. Maybe I should have. I think I'm going to ask for him to be put on a different unit after this. Deep recon this evening. We're splitting up to try and hunt down where they're storing this thing. Lev and I pulled the short stick and have to hike it around the sewer system. Honestly, it can't be any worse than Topside. At least I won't have to keep seeing the blank, empty faces of these people. Date, June 6th. Henry is dead. We didn't get back until early this morning. We'd been off the radio for several hours because of all the interference. It seems areas affected by this thing screw with radio waves pretty bad. The sewer was a nightmare, but no sign of alteration by the item. When we came back up, Paul gave me the news. Henry and Paul were exploring near the center of the city when they got attacked. A mob of people swarmed them and dragged Henry off. Paul was hurt, and his suit was badly damaged, and he had to leave for medical attention. Henry was screaming over the radio for a while, and then... It cut off. Paul and a couple other mole rats charged in with some agents to recover Henry, but after a few minutes, Henry came back on the radio. His receiver was broken, but he could still broadcast. One of the agents was recording, and he played it back to Lev and I to see if any of it made sense to us. It didn't. He was rambling and sounded like he was hurt. Kept talking about the endless heart of the city, the hell of glass, just crazy stuff. Paul and the rescue team kept trying to find him, 
But suddenly his radio cut out again. Henry came tearing down one of those tiny halls, helmet off and screaming like a madman. He ran right by Paul and smashed an agent into a wall on his way by. He slammed into a dead end and just exploded through it, right out of the building. He fell six stories, onto some metal junk. It took an hour to get his body untangled. We're done screwing around here. Agent Parks, Lev, and me are rounding up what amounts to the city elders, and we're getting to the damn bottom of this. Date. June 7th. Interrogation went well. Agent Parks asked the questions. We provided what he called negative consequences for non-cooperation. The first guy, some triad punk, didn't want to talk. Two broken legs later, and he was a lot more open. Said the thing was called The Builder, and nobody knew when it first came to the city. He never had anything to do with it, just helped stand guard outside rooms where it was working. He said that was all he knew, and that we had to talk to one of the elders, long when, if we wanted it. He apologized for Henry's death, said it was just the way of things. I broke his jaw in three places. Long Wen may be the oldest looking man I've ever seen, and with a will like iron. He just took everything we dished out, and didn't say a word. Parks said that the next stop was his wife and grandkids, and that got him talking. Told us it was kept in one of the oldest parts of the city, some old temple. It had grown and made wonderful things, but only the worthy could look upon it and not be overwhelmed by it. He said Henry was shown the wonders, in the hopes that he would be able to convince us not to take the builder, but that he was not worthy and was broken. We made him show us where they keep it. Long Wen said it wouldn't do any good, that it was buried too deep. They moved it deep inside when they first caught wind of the agents. He said we'd never get it back. We're doing deep work tomorrow, and we're not coming out without it. Date. June 10th. Been out for a while. This place is amazing. At first, it was just a temple that was too big inside. Neat, but nothing new. Then we went in deeper. Whole rooms, altars, everything recreated and rearranged by this thing. It's like someone built 12 whole temples inside this one tiny structure. Agent Parks set up a recall point in the main hall with some other agents to make sure nobody sneaks up on us. We suited up and went to work. It started getting odd after hour six. Lots of hallways, not as many rooms. Then, 83 rooms, all connected by those sliding doors, each with a tiny Buddha in the center of the floor and nothing else. Lev grabbed a few for samples. We knew these things were getting odd when we came to a perfect reproduction of the first altar room, but appearing to be made of one solid mass of wood. Thing was beautiful and totally seamless, and not a single tool mark on anything. Paul found some documents, and we scanned them back to Parks. He said they were about the object. Apparently, they're calling it SCP-184 now. Parks said it talks about how they moved 184 deeper each time it made a new area. They thought it was some gift from God or something. Used it to expand rooms, if people would donate to the temple, or at least to the gangs that controlled it at the time. I've never been in a place like this. It's getting harder to maneuver. The halls are starting to get strange. They go up at funny angles, and the last few rooms have been tiny. By Lev's count, we should be 20 feet above the roof of this whole city by now. Date. June 12th? I'm getting sick of this place. Came to a branch yesterday, had to split the team. I drew the up hallway and set out. Not sure how long I've been climbing. The halls aren't regular anymore. They wave in and out, like a frozen earthquake. Everything seems to be made of stone here. Managed to squeeze into a side room to catch my breath. Once I looked around, I saw everything was made of jade. It was all colored right and had the right texture, but it was jade. Bed, chairs, table, books, everything. I sat on the bed for two hours and didn't think. I got up and smashed the jade lamp that was probably worth more than my life and left. I'm not feeling well. I feel really disconnected here, like an astronaut or something. It's not like other areas I've been in. Never felt so alone. I'm fine. I know that. 
It's Henry dying, the whole rotten city outside, and me being alone and able to think too much. Rats are tested for mental stability, and I passed with flying colors. It's just my nerves. I'm sitting on a chair made of thousands of tiny dragon statues, writing on a table made of super dense paper, and I am fine. Date. June. I've been out too long. Food low. Water low. Not out yet, but getting there. Hearing things. Keep thinking I hear voices. Been climbing for days. Saw light today. At the end of a side hall. Bright yellow light. I climbed into the hall and ran. Smashed through the door, and it was a room. Millions of candles. All lit, but just another room. Pulled off my helmet. Smashed the candles with it. Broke my lenses. Neck seal. Radio. Didn't care. Sat and cried for hours. Dropped a pick down the shaft today. Never heard it hit bottom. Almost jumped to go get it, but stopped. Got to find this thing. Going to smash it to bits. Stomp it. Crush it. Date. June. Food out. Suit can't make any more water. Saw a hall with 10,000 doors. Ran down it. Smashed a bunch. Then kept climbing. Lost my boots. Floor looked like carpet. Made of super sharp stone. Cut suit to ribbons. Feet too. Blood all over the shaft. Hope it appreciates it. Going to crush this thing. Feel it shatter in my hand. Hate this place. Keep hearing Henry. Keep telling him he's dead. Won't listen. Date. Unknown. Top of shaft. Hall to forever. Lights everywhere. Going to kill the heart. Date. Unknown. Hell is heaven. Heaven is hell. Life is wonderful. Notes. Gordon Richards went missing during the recovery of SCP-184, presumed KIA. SCP-184 recovered by Team Zeta-9. Journal recovered in rubble, left from destruction of SCP-184 affected temple. Item number. SCP-188. Object class. Safe. Special containment procedures. As SCP-188 poses no direct threat to any Foundation assets, SCP-188 is to be contained in Storage Unit J6-455. Its presence is to be noted during the bi-weekly survey of site assets. During this time, any environmental effects exerted by SCP-188 are to be reversed. Description: SCP-188 is a volume of iridium metal hosting an effect that acts on a finite region around the object. With the exception of the regional effect, SCP-188 is chemically and physically an otherwise unremarkable sample of iridium metal. SCP-188 has a mass of 181.43 grams and has been cast as a cylinder with a radius of 1 centimeter and a length of 2.56 centimeters. SCP-188's current cylindrical shape is not its original form but one convenient for experimental manipulation and storage. The regional effect of SCP-188 induces changes in the environment. The changes take the form of discrete manipulations, such as scratches on surfaces, or grouping and shaping of ambient material, such as dust. These changes emerge over time, and are widespread over the entire region of the effect. The changes show a high degree of complexity and structure, and have been seen to change with time. Further, the effect extends to all scales, and has included exceptionally small and intricate structures. When initially contained by the Foundation, SCP-188 consistently induced fractal motifs. Since containment, this has increasingly shifted to include spiral and flow motifs. Biological forms have emerged as a rare but consistent theme. As the environment around it is manipulated, SCP-188's regional effect will extend outward. Testing has shown that this region will only extend outward to a volume encompassing an area of roughly 4,000 meters squared. Attempts to nullify SCP-188's effect have included placement in a Faraday cage, placement in a radiation containment device, powdering, and melting SCP-188. 
None of these attempts have diminished the regional effect in any way. Current proposals to vaporize SCP-188 and recondense small portions of the vapor are being explored. SCP-188 first came to the attention of a predecessor body to the Foundation in 1920 located at the rural Indiana properties of After a thorough search, the object was found as a spike partially submerged in the ground and appeared to be in the process of reshaping the local wheat crop through braiding together and flattening of stalks. No clear pattern had emerged at time of acquisition, though the effect had begun to extend over many meters. Though records are incomplete, it is known that efforts to contain the effect of the object failed. Embedding in bulk material, such as concrete or lead, did not diminish the initial size of the region the effect acted over. Further, these attempts ended with the object carving apart the containment sheath. The foundation is evidence that more esoteric proposals were suggested, such as encasement in diamond. No evidence exists that these technologically sophisticated and resource-intensive proposals were followed up on. When this parent organization was folded into the Foundation, the object and any existing records were inherited and placed under the SCP-188 classification. When the Crop Circle fad emerged, efforts were taken to determine if there was a connection between the Crop Circle makers and the effects caused by SCP-188. Investigation showed no connection beyond the superficial, and it is the opinion of the O5s that the similarity is a coincidence. Proposals to explore or to illustrate any statistical consistency in the effect SCP-188 has upon its environment are being accepted and evaluated. At this time, due to the lack of inherent danger posed by SCP-188 in its current containment, proposals requiring extreme measures or contact with other SCPs are not encouraged. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, Subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.